Hello? Oh, hello, Carrie. Hi, Jacob. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I didn't notice you here. But then why did I say hello? I guess I screwed that up. I guess you did, and that's okay. <laughs> well, welcome to our podcast, which I have very exciting news. What would that news be? We figured out a name for it. Holy shit. <laughs> I know. Uh, and it, well, the name was your idea, so why don't you unveil it? Unveil it. I will unveil it. <laughs> We're doing great. Our podcast is called Love Ya Like Crazy, with the ya being a YA. So love YA or young adult books like crazy. Oh, and then there's also another piece of news that might be of interest to some, uh, which is that since the last time we recorded our podcast, and probably long before this is released, Carrie has given birth to a tiny baby. A very tiny baby. His name is Bruce. Uh, he is currently sleeping, which makes me very happy, um, which also means I'm allowed to put him down and do this podcast right now. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. He's now 20 days old, al- almost 20 days old. Wow. I know. Changing every day. Eh, not really. No. <laughs> no, he's still just a tiny little jerk. I gotcha. Anyway. So the book that we're going to talk today is a book that I picked. It is called Young Adult Novel, and it's by Daniel Pinkwater. And then next week, if you want to get a jump on that, we're going to be reading The Hidden Staircase by Carolyn Keene, which is the second book in the Nancy Drew series, which was picked specifically to be something that Carrie could read in five-minute spurts between (laughs) the Not being able to put the baby down. Yeah. So uh, it's not really a young adult novel, but we want to read it. And so, so there. (laughs) Yeah. That's one great thing about having your own podcast. You can make up the rules as you go along. Yeah. So uh, it might not be YA, but who gives a shit? So we'll be talking about young adult novel by Daniel Pinkwater today. And there are going to be a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't read it yet, you can, you know, stop the podcast and read it if you would like. I mean, it's like 67 pages long, so it will not take long to read. Or if you don't care about spoilers, then you can just listen and come to your own conclusions as to whether or not you want to read it, I suppose. What the hell did you ask me to read? Oh, well, that's a good question. (laughs) This was some book. Yeah. Did you not care for it? I don't know how I felt about it. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. It was was so quick and then it was done. And I (laughs) feel like maybe I didn't get the joke. So why did you choose this book? I think in part it's because you chose this very strange kind of postmodern take on the young adult novel for your first one. (laughs) And then I kind of thought, well, what's the weirdest book I've read? Let me one up her. (laughs) Well, I don't know that I did that, but. uh, Oh, I think you did. (laughs) um, And I wanted to do a Daniel Pinkwater book. And so it was kind of between this and Alan Mandelson, Boy from Mars. I don't know if you've ever read that one. I haven't read any of the Pinkwater books. This okay. was my first. Daniel Pinkwater has written a lot of pretty strange books for kids and young adults. And this is maybe one of the stranger. I don't know exactly how you measure that. Mm-hmm. I I think I like it for a couple of reasons. One is, for me, it's very evocative of a particular era. Oh, which it is, definitely is. Yeah. When, when do you think it was written? I would say... Early to mid eighties. Yeah, nineteen eighty two. So yeah, I mean, because you know, when when they were describing Kevin Shapiro's, you know, clothes and how he looked, I was like, oh wow, he is, you know, ducky basically. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Because I went to high school in the late eighties, mm-hmm. and so it's a little bit before my time. But uh, you know, I went to a big faceless regional high school. I mean, I was not nearly the kind of social outcast that the Dada Ducks are. But nonetheless, there are some things in there that kind of have the ring of truth for me. And then I also, like, this was my experience in reading it. I, like, sort of read along, and there are, like, all these weird things in it. Uh, You know, it's at Himmler High School. Yeah. The rival school is Kissinger High School. And there's all these kind of strange political references, and it's hard to know exactly what they mean. And... So I had this experience sort of going along trying to figure out, like, you know, what exactly is going on and and what does it all mean? And that's how it ends. Yeah. This is a, a book that, for me, the end really 
made it all kind of click. Does it seem possible, asked Igor, that Kevin Shapiro seized control of the entire school just so he could have us covered with wet breakfast cereal? No one was sure. It could have been planned from the start, or it could have just been an idea that occurred to him in the moment. The important question, said Captain Colossal, is what is the significance of Kevin's rise to power and the Grape Nuts attack? What does it mean in philosophical terms? This is more or less the question I had. Maybe not the full philosophical terms part. <laughs> um, yes, said the Indian Zephyr. What is the moral of the story? It has no moral, said the Honorable Venustiano Carranza, President of Mexico. It is a Dada story. And I read that. And I was like, well, there it is. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I can yeah. work with that. When I got to the end of the book and I was like, oh, it's a Dada story. I was like, you bastard. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that's fair, too. I mean, it's kind of a, a shaggy dog story in a way, in that yeah. kind of way. I found a blog post on LiveJournal about... Was it the Kevin Shapiro LiveJournal.com? Oh, no, I didn't even see that. There's a I? whole uh, live journal um, with just Kevin Shapiro boy orphan stories. Were they any good? Some of them were not bad. Some of them were not good. Yeah, fair enough. But about what you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good Venn diagram. Anyway. <laughs> no, this is on someone named Rush That Speaks. Rush dash that dash speaks on Live Journal. Talked about Daniel Pinkwater as a surrealist. So, you know, uh, one of the things they do is they print up a bunch of cards that say Horace Gerstenblut n'exist pas, mm -hmm. which is a reference to um, René Magritte, who I think is a surrealist, yes. who made pictures of pipes and it says... This is uh, not a pipe. Right. Which, because it's not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe, I think, is at least one interpretation of that. Correct. So in this case, Rush That Speaks notes that Horace Gerstenblut does not, in fact, exist. Uh, and they say, Horace Gerstenblut is, in fact, a character in a book. He is a representation of a high school principal and of a cliched one at that. It is impossible to tell Horace Gerstenblut that he does not exist because Horace Gerstenblut does not exist. <laughs> So I, uh, I like that. There, there you go. <laughs> there I go. As I said, this book is kind of a shaggy dog story. Not all of Pinkwater's books are like that. Um, and so even if you did not particularly care for this one, as Carrie, it seems you did not. Uh, I mean, I do think it's worth seeking out some of his other ones. Alan Mendelssohn, Boy from Mars, is another one that is based in high school, but is maybe less... I mean, this one is kind of crazy, but it's also kind of realistic, whereas in that one, um, there's ESP and, and different planes of existence and all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, and there's none of that in this book. It's, you know, it's a bunch of kids who don't know anything about Dadaism yeah. <laughs> who decided that they were going to become Dadaists, right? The which is really, really weird and funny. But yeah, there's nothing like supernatural about the story. Yeah. I don't remember how they got into it, but didn't they hear about it? or Because they didn't even realize that Marcel Duchamp was a real person. The Honorable Venustiano Carranza, president of Mexico, the leader of the group, uh, I guess had read about Duchamp someplace and brought it up. Because it says at the end of the first chapter, it says, by the way, it turns out that the Honorable, etc., had not made Dada up in his own head. It is a real movement, and Marcel Duchamp was a real person. I found that out only after being a Dadaist myself for months. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, fan I don't know, I thought that was pretty fantastic. You know, and then I, and I also feel like the whole stuff about the election is well observed. Like, I guess there are the people who are running who take it somewhat seriously. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else doesn't really care. No, because it's not going to make any difference. Right. And then ultimately the principal can override it, you know, so it doesn't. Nothing matters anyway. <laughs> yeah. Your vote is pointless. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Have I uh, adequately answered the question of why I made you read this book? <laughs> I don't know. There's each and every one of the ducks. Yeah. I found them to be completely insufferable. That's fair. At the same time, I'm pretty sure my drama club in high school had each and every one of those kids in it. <laughs> sure. I'm like, oh, yeah, Charles the Cat, mm -hmm. Captain Colossal, Indiana Zephyr. They were all in my drama club because I think that's the group of people that are the most – that and, again, you know, I, I, I think you were probably in band, correct? Oh, yes. 
Yes, I definitely was. So, yes, the drama geeks and band geeks were of the same, at least in my high school, level of in, insufferability, <laughs> if that's even a word. I say it is. I say it is as well. And I'm just, you know, these these five kids, yeah, they they were in band, they were in drama in my high school, absolutely. And I hated them for it. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I'm one of those people, therefore I hate myself. Mm. Oh, well. That makes me sad. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I was oh, I was the worst in high school. <laughs> I was the absolute worst. I probably would have done some of this stuff as well had I thought about it, had I, you know, cared from the wild Dada Duck manifesto down to the, the toilet, down to, you know, Kevin Shapiro's rise to fame himself. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hate them because I probably was one of them. So Kevin Shapiro, the story within a story or the stories within a story was an interesting thing that these kids wrote stories about a, a fictional Kevin Shapiro. Yeah. And... He was sort of a, a hard luck boy orphan. Right. Although his parents are also characters in some of those. His parents so. are also characters. They may or may not be, you know, sane. Yes. His sister may or may not be a whore. Right. But they they are there, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so Kevin Shapiro, boy orphan, and Kevin Shapiro, the actual Kevin Shapiro, is there any connection between the two or is it just? Well, I will tell you what I think about that. Since you asked. I did ask. First of all, oh, before we get to that, I just want to mention there, <laughs> there are no parents in this, in this book at all, right? I don't think anyone's parents appear. No, they are talked about in the sequel. Yes. But they are not at all in the original. So it says, sometimes Kevin is an orphan, sometimes a juvenile delinquent, a druggie, a lonely child of feuding parents, a social mitfit, a homosexual, a weakling who wants to play sports, and any number of other kinds of hard luck characters. So the actual Kevin Shapiro is not really any of those. I mean, he's kind of a geeky loner who likes comic books, but he doesn't seem that down and out. Uh, but a lot of these things do apply to the ducks themselves, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Like the absence of the parents. Like I kind of wonder about the lonely child of feuding parents. Because they, they, they have their little social group, but nobody else wants it to have anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. A social mitfit, certainly. So I kind of felt like, in a sense... I, I feel like Kevin is kind of a stand-in for the ducks themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the, the desire to just kill them off when it gets boring is like, it's an odd thing. I speak as someone who writes songs that virtually never have happy endings. Which is what I like about them. Sure. <laughs> so that's sort of what I made of that. And then, you know, when they find the real life Kevin, they try to kind of, they would like to kind of fit him into their own narrative. They try to fit him into their story, mm -hmm. but he rebels against it and ultimately has his revenge on them. So should we get to the homework? I think we can get to the homework. Mine is pretty terrible. I, I feel like the purpose of these is not to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I literally wrote it in five minutes just thinking about like, how shitty can Kevin Shapiro's life be? Yeah. Do you think we should read our own or each other's? It's up to you. What would you like to do? I can I can send you mine if you want, or I can just read it. Uh, whatever works for you. Well, let's send them to each other and okay. see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did not number my chapter, however. That's all right. That's not required. Okay. Kevin Shapiro, Boy Orphan. Kevin couldn't believe what the doctor was telling him. Not only was his liver shot from years of alcohol abuse, he started drinking at the age of 12 after his parents went insane, after his younger sister started her career as a stripper, but he was pregnant. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. It's, it's bad. <laughs> he really didn't know how he became pregnant. He'd only been selling his body for drugs for a few weeks, but the test was positive. The doctor looked down at the frail 16-year-old boy st sitting on the exam table and said simply, Kevin, you're a medical freak. Nothing good can happen to you. You should consider killing yourself. <laughs> Kevin contemplated his options and thought that this was probably a good decision. He dressed and left the doctor's office, brimming with hope. He hoped his death would be as good as his life was bad. Kevin Shapiro jumped off the roof of the highest building in the city. It was not very tall. Kevin Shapiro, not surprisingly, lived. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. 
That's my terrible Kevin Shapiro story. I like the twist ending. Why, thank you. So here's yours. Okay. Kevin Shapiro, Boy Orphan, Chapter 90210. Kevin awoke with a start to the sound of the jailer hitting the bars of the cell door with his nightstick. Got your last meal ready for you here. A waste of good food, you ask me, he growled unsympathetically. Kevin rubbed his eyes and sat up. Tears started to well up in his eyes as he retrieved his dinner and dejectedly wolfed down the hamburger, which was cooked rare and with ketchup and pickles just the way he liked it, to be on death row and for a murder he didn't even commit. If it had been for one of the many people whose deaths he really was responsible for, then that would have been another matter, but this just seemed unfair. Suddenly, unexpectedly, the guard was back. Just got a call. Appears your sister got to the governor somehow. You've been pardoned. He grunted in disgust. Guess you're free to go. But it was too late for Kevin, who had already expired from salmonella poisoning. (laughs) It's true what they say. Consuming raw or undercooked meats really can increase your risk of foodborne illnesses. The end. There you go. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Kevin Shapiro. Will you ever win? No. No, he will not. And that's okay. Yeah. Oh, let me ask you this. Okay. Uh, would you actually consider this a young adult novel despite the title? No. Oh, yeah. I would not consider this a young adult novel. I think most people in the young adult um, demographic, a lot of this would go over their head. Or... It needs to be for younger kids who will just go with the flow and just like think it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I think you have to either be younger than 12 or older than 20 something to be able to get the book. That's my own personal take. What do you think? Yeah, I kind of agree. I think that probably younger. I, I, I don't really know that Pinkwater. I don't know that he thinks of demographics in that way, but I would think that he would be expect that you know people who are a little younger than i would think young adult would be i think yeah a a younger person would probably find this hilarious yeah i kind of didn't but i also at least understood all the reference or a lot of the references that were being made in the book Mm -hmm. you know i understood who you know marcel duchamp was i understood you know a lot of the other references you know from the high school names to stuff like that. Um, Whereas, you know, a younger person wouldn't, but I think, you know, a young adult couldn't care less. And young adult, I guess like 16 to early twenties. Is that roughly? I would say probably, yeah. 14, 15 to early twenties, depending on when the book was written. Mm -hmm. I think young adult books now are probably geared more towards you know 16 and up whereas earlier you know young adult novels would have been for slightly younger yeah there's just more you know a lot more of the nudie pants stuff in books now (laughs) right yeah i mean uh the second book in the series here there's talk of masturbation and things but oh yes there is (laughs) (laughs) uh nothing graphic but yeah, and at the same time, you don't necessarily believe it anyway. It's just there's no. talk of it. There's not actual, you know, there isn't anything in the nudie pants variety. There's just, you know, a kid in a locker, maybe jacking off, maybe not. Yeah. A story like this couldn't exist now. It couldn't be set in the present mm-hmm. because I'm like, a kid would whip out his cell phone and look it up. 13 seconds know exactly what was going on but these kids you know went to the at least in the second book went to the library to to find out about zen yes and the only thing that they could find was a cookbook right so they became you know zen masters based on a a zen cooking um book so i think the fact that it is both written and set in in a time that does not have the internet is important this could not exist now that's true and also like the whole thing where they the uh, horace kirsten boot and exist pa part of how it spreads is people trying to figure out what it means yeah but google translate would 
presumably fix that up pretty quick. And they also, you know, any stalking that they did, um, any 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 Kevin stalking would have been a lot more subtle because you know you can just Google somebody, right, or, or look them up Facebook. on Facebook. Yep, that's a good point. And so you know, every time I pick this book up, which was you know five minutes here, five minutes there, you know, at yep. five in the morning, it just it struck me how much I, I guess that this book is sort of is stuck in its its time it it, it couldn't be written now at yeah. least not as it is right is there anything else i don't know i think because this book is so short and because i mean there's not i don't have a lot to say about it other than what the hell did i read yeah i didn't dislike it i'll, I'll say that i did not dislike it mostly because i don't really dislike many books in sure. general like books you know books are cool and the fact that this weird ass book, you know, written by this weird ass guy about these weird ass kids was, you know, not only written but published and read by other people. I'm like, that's pretty magical. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I'm, I, maybe I should have picked a different one. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, it didn't really catch you, but I would like to congratulate us on our Sarah Ellenson level uh, writing of our Kevin Shapiro stories. I, I would agree. I mean, we did not have any eldritch horror. But oh, why didn't we have any Eldritch horror? What were we thinking? Oh my God! <laughs> Kevin Shapiro needed some Eldritch horror. Ah, uh, seems Next so obvious time. in retrospect. <laughs> I oh, know, well. right? Kevin Shapiro, that little ant. <laughs> <laughs> so the next book that we're going to read is, let's see, a Nancy Drew book. Which oh yeah. So with all this talk of young adult novels, um. Carrie and I were talking about what book to read next. And I said, I know this is an actually young adult, but I think we should operate on the theory that it's our podcast and we can do whatever the heck we want. I concur with this, with this uh, <laughs> statement. Yeah. So our next book, uh, and we also wanted to do something short that didn't require lots of heavy thinking. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, he heavy thinking plus me at this point in my life, not happening. I have a newborn at home who, you know, screams if I put him down, Yep, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So I do all of my best reading at, you know, five in the morning or six in the morning. So actually thinking cannot do that. Yeah. So for our next book, we're going to read a Nancy Drew story, which I believe is the second one in the series, uh, The Hidden Stairway. Do I have that right? Hidden Staircase. So that one. So I don't know if we want to do homework again. I am OK with doing homework, especially if I can do it five minutes before class starts. Oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> uh, I was thinking that. So not to give anything away, but this book ends very quickly. <laughs> So I thought maybe we could come up with sort of a, an idea for a different way that the book could have ended. Maybe okay. sort of how the, a different way the last chapter or two could have gone. Or a, a different solution. Okay. Perhaps is a, another way to go for it. I'm actually really excited to read. And this is, you know, me being kind of lame. I've never read a Nancy Drew book. I've played, what, 32 Nancy Drew video games. Mm-hmm. I have never read one of the books, and so I'm excited to actually have a reason to read the books. And I think the older ones are, at least from what I've been told, they're kind of awful in how they describe people. Mm -hmm. Like her friends, you know, there's no mincing words. They're just like, oh, yeah, that's the chubby friend. Or So I'm just, you know, I'm sort of interested in, in how... Nancy Drew has evolved from, you know, how they were originally written to, you know, from now the games that I play are as PC as PC can be with, you know, all sorts of different races and ethnicities, you know, being represented in each game. And I think there might be an Irish man in this. Ooh. All right. So that'll be it. Nancy Drew, The Hidden Staircase. People at home read it along if you're interested. And if you want to join us in our homework come up with an alternative solution for the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm.
great to talk to you, Carrie. Always good to talk to you, Jacob. All right, and I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. Uh, obviously, we have to talk about this book. We so do, yes. you, you will talk to me sort of soon. Right, we have a contractual obligation. Yeah, it's true. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there.